you're looking to create your next Dungeons and Dragons character and you are considering creating a halfling, but you're not familiar with halflings and you don't really know where to start, that's what we're going to cover in this video as we take a look at some of the common species of Dungeons and Dragons, in particular halflings today. So in this video we are going to cover what the Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook tells us about halflings, who they are and what they represent. We're going to take a look at how they work mechanically and what benefits there are of playing a halfling. And we're also going to go through a series of questions that you could ask yourself to help you further roleplay a halfling and differentiate a halfling from perhaps some of the other species within the game of Dungeons and Dragons and bring that roleplaying to the fore, which is one of the main things that we like to help you to do. Halflings are a species of uh, people that are cherished by gods who value home, family and community. Uh, they often therefore live in peaceful, rural areas and surrounded often by loved ones, friends and family, etc. But despite loving home, many halflings are very brave and very adventurous, eager to explore the world and, and make many new friends wherever they can. Halflings are actually, as the name suggests, uh, quite small, quite diminutive. They're about the size of a human child, which is actually very helpful for them because it helps them to stay unnoticed in crowds or even uh, squeeze through small spaces. Halflings are known by many of the other species of the Dungeons & Dragons multiverse for their luck. When they're in danger, it feels like an unseen force seems to help them to avoid any harm. In fact, many believe, within the multiverse of Dungeons & Dragons, that this luck actually comes from the gods that they are uh, so beloved by. Gods such as Yondala, Brand of Barris, and uh, Charmelaine um, being some of those gods from different settings, for example, uh, but very much known for being uh, lucky folk. And thanks to their luck and the gods that love them, halflings are known to live to around 150 years old, so they will often outlive uh, humans, provided uh, nothing untoward happens to them on their adventuring journeys. And halflings live in many different types of communities. You will often see halflings living in peaceful villages, uh, but there are other halfling communities like the Boromar clan in the world of Eberron that are known to run crime syndicates or um, territorial mobs. And there are two different types of halflings. There's the strong heart or stout halflings. Those are the sorts of halflings that much prefer to live underground. They are the kind of hobbits from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and the hobbits uh, very much fit into that stout halfling category. And then there is the light foot or tall fellow halflings. These are the nomadic halflings or even the halflings that are happy to live amongst humans and taller races. So you're actually probably more likely in kind of civilized areas to stumble upon a light foot or a tall fellow halfling. So that is the narrative behind who halflings are and what is assumed about them in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. So now let's take a look at the halfling traits. These are the mechanical benefits that you might get from playing a halfling. So first of all, the basics, they are considered a humanoid. They are also considered small, which makes them smaller than most of the other player character species or races that you might play within the game. Most would fall into the medium category. These fall into the small category, which has some mechanical impacts on small versus medium creatures. But crucially also, they stand about two to three foot tall. So when you're creating your character, think about what their height might fall into within that range. And they have a speed of 30 feet, which falls in line with uh, most of the other species that you would play as a player character in the 2024 Player's Handbook. The other things, and these are much more kind of unique benefits, includes Brave, which means that you have advantage on saving throws that you make to avoid or end the Frightened Condition. And if you're new to the game, you might not be too familiar with the Frightened Condition. The Frightened Condition affects your ability checks and attacks, giving you disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls whilst the source of your fear is within line of sight. So if you tuck around the corner, that disadvantage doesn't apply anymore. But so long as your halfling, in this case, or your character, can see the source of the fear, 
they have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls. The other impact is that a creature who is frightened can't willingly move closer to that source of fear. So they can only stay where they are or move away. So that does limit you tactically in terms of what you might be able to do both in and out of combat. So that's a frightened condition. So just to remind you that Brave gives you advantage on saving throws that you make to avoid frightened or to end your frightened state. A halfling also gets halfling nimbleness, which means that they can move through the space of any creature that is a size larger than them, but you can't stop in that same space. So standard rule is that you can only move through the space of a friendly creature but you can't stop in that same space, you can't end your turn there. For a halfling, it doesn't matter if they are friend or foe, so long as they are medium or bigger, but equally, as is standard, they can't end their turn in that same space. But it does allow them to move through enemy squares without issue, which tactically can be a huge game changer when you're playing on a grid, certainly. Halfling is also known, and this was talked about in the narrative, for their lucky quality. They're considered a very lucky folk. And when you roll a 1 on a d20 test, so that covers ability checks, saving throws, and attack rolls, you get to re-roll. However, you have to take the new one. I'm sure people will tell me, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. So if you roll a 1, which is generally pretty bad, you can then re-roll that number, but you have to take the new result. Also, halflings are naturally stealthy, which means that you can take the hide action even when you're obscured only by a creature that is at least one size larger than you. I just wanted to touch base with you on what the prerequisites are for hiding normally. So with the hide action, you can try to conceal yourself and you do so by uh, trying to succeed on a DC 15 dexterity stealth check. Uh, which means that your total roll, when you roll the dice and add your modifiers, must meet or exceed 15 in order to be successful. But you can only try and do this while you are either heavily obscured, which means in darkness, for example, or behind three quarters cover or total cover. So three quarters cover means that you are covered by three quarters so perhaps only they can see your head so you could potentially try and hide behind three quarters cover or total cover which again is going to cause you to be essentially heavily obscured in that the, they, you can't be seen you can't be targeted behind total cover and you also must be out of an enemy's line of sight if you can see a creature you can discern whether or not it can see you now obviously if you're behind total cover or heavily obscured you're already out of line of sight where the naturally stealthy feature really kicks in is that uh, you don't have to be heavily obscured or lightly obscured it can be both normally with the hide action you'd have to be heavily obscured but with the naturally stealthy feature being lightly obscured is fine so long as you are indeed obscured but it has to be by a creature that is at least one size larger than you so you have to if you basically move behind a medium sized creature or bigger you can then actually take the hide action regardless of how it relates to the normal prerequisites for hiding. I hope that makes sense for you. Those are all of the traits that a halfling gets, um, those mechanical benefits for choosing a halfling, which are pretty good, I would say. You've got your advantage on uh, being frightened or against being frightened. You have the luck feature which means you can re-roll any ones on a d20 it also means that you can move through enemy squares so long as you don't finish your turn there and also you can hide easier than most other people so a lot of stuff packed in there but in terms of actually role playing a halfling and utilizing the narrative to really create that halfling character here are a few questions that you could ask yourself about your character First of all, your connection to your community. Does your character value home and family above everything else? Or are they more drawn to the wider world? Do they prefer perhaps adventure? How would they balance the two if they are drawn to the, the wider world and a bit of adventure, for example? Now, a halfling would often have an adventurous spirit. So what would have led your character to leave that peaceful life behind? Was it perhaps curiosity or a sense of duty to something else? 
or maybe a personal goal that they might have had themselves. Perhaps they want to see the world, for example. How would your halfling deal with danger? How do they react when their luck saves them from harm? Do they think that it's the gods doing, as we talked about with the narrative earlier, of the gods' influence and their favour for halflings? Or does your halfling just put it down to coincidence? Are they believers that the gods are protecting them? Or is it actually just fate doing its thing? And what is your halfling's relationship with the gods? Which, if any, of the halfling gods does your character honour or believe in? And how does their belief in luck influence their actions or decisions? Uh, Are they a little bit more gung-ho about things, for example? Are they one who's willing to gamble because they know that luck is on their side, for example? Or might they just be a little bit more reckless in things that they might be willing to do or not, because they believe that, again, luck is on their side. And what is your halfling's role within their community? What kind of halfling community does your character come from? Is it a secluded shire, as in Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, or is it perhaps a little bit more of a dangerous setting like a criminal syndicate or a territorial mob or something like that? What is their perception of their small stature how do they feel about it do they use it to their advantage or do they dream of a life of being a taller or stronger individual and what are their experiences of other species within the D&D multiverse has your character spent any time living amongst humans or other tall folk and how do they view any of those relationships with those humans or other tall folk Are they nomadic or are they settled? Does your halfling prefer a stable life in one place? Or do they have that restless wandering spirit? Are they a home bird? Or do they prefer to go out adventuring and exploring the world, not staying in one place for too long? What is their connection to luck? Does your character, or rather how does your character, rely on their luck in tight situations? And are they confident or cautious because of it? Are they confident, again, as I mentioned, very gung-ho, very reckless about things because they believe that luck is on their side? Or are they cautious because they've been lucky so far and one day perhaps their luck might run out? And what are their life goals? Does your halfling dream of returning to a peaceful life, or are they always looking to seek that next adventure? So those are just a number of questions that you can ask yourself. I'm hoping to put together a kind of worksheet that you can go through over on Patreon, which I will link to below, that will just allow you to go through some of these questions if you want to print that out and scribble and and doodle on that. That will be available uh, for download in the links below. But I hope those questions are useful for you to help to determine how you could make your halfling perhaps feel different from a human, for example, or a more run-of-the-mill character. You want that culture of halflings to really influence your roleplay if you can, and these questions might really help you to do that. So I hope that you found that helpful. Do give us a thumbs up uh, or a like if you did find that helpful or find that interesting at least. That will really help to let the YouTube algorithm know that people are enjoying this video and of course if you did want more videos like this or indeed to watch D&D at play in our actual play show Bardic Quest uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon as well so you're notified when we upload a new video but thank you my friends for tuning in and going through the halfling stats traits and qualities with me in this video I hope you enjoyed it and otherwise I will catch you on the next video